Kia ora Health Select Committee. Thank you so much for allowing me to have right of response to the oral submissions that were given to you from Ministry of Health slash MedSafe and ACC. Before I address those, I just want to bring up a few areas as well. Uh, in the Ministry of Health's written submission, it states changes to labelling are being considered but will be at secondary and tertiary instrument level. Now this is concerning as primary also should be included, which means yet again, the consumers, the people who are out there taking these medicines will not be getting informed consent. Additionally, the Ministry of Health stated in their written submission that the use of Epilim was contraindicated in pregnancy in 2005, meaning that informed consent is required for use in pregnancy as this is off-label use. Well, clearly this is not being adhered to because one of the last accepted ACC claims was actually for a two-year-old. So, which also highlights an area that any woman who was taking Epilim during pregnancy since 2005 should be automatically getting her baby accepted by ACC if the baby has been harmed. Now one of the easiest solutions would be to make it legislative that all anti-epileptic medicines are dispensed in the original boxes with additional warnings and pictograms around pregnancy and that the boxes also include the patient information leaflet uh, similar to a consumer information leaflet. Now cigarette packaging is a similar example of having warning images on boxes. Now I just want to show you something that's happening in the United Kingdom. Now I know it's going to be backwards to you so please excuse it. But you can see the foil packaging that the medicine comes in, it's now got a pictogram on it. There is no reason why this shouldn't be made legislative here in New Zealand as well. And I know that MedSafe and Sanofi, who the pharmaceutical company is, is currently having discussions about that and other things. Now, also, I know that um, Chris James was talking about, you know, packages, you know, they're not always c coming in the uh, f manufacturer's packaging and it's getting taken out and put in into, you know, like the white boxes. Now, if that's the case, we need to have that extra uh, allow safeguarding warning system, all sorts of additional warnings. Now, again, the foil, like I've just shown you, would actually be a great way to help with that. Um, and also, it's a visual versus words, because I know that it was um, also getting raised yesterday that sometimes the words can be confusing around the warnings. Well, a pictogram pictogram is a lot clearer. And now there are other areas I want to address. It was a reoccurrence in the oral submission that we were talking about 10% of the congenital malformations when it came to sodium valprate. Now, and then I, I know Susan Kenyon said 90% will be okay. Well, the problem with sodium valproate is that we know that up to 40% of babies exposed to sodium valproate in utero will be affected. So you cannot say that 90% of babies will be okay. You are referring to congenital abnormalities and yet again, this is not all about congenital abnormalities. There is neurodevelopmental issues and a whole lot more going on. So we need to keep that in mind when we're actually talking about this. The risks are very high when you're talking around sodium valproate. Again, there was a lot of discussion around sodium valproate. Sodium valproate is the anti-epileptic medicine that carries the most risk, as far as we know. However, all anti-epileptic medicines carry a risk to an unborn baby. 
So we need to be making sure that all the anti-epileptic medicines carry a warning on them. It's not okay to be just focusing on one over the other. Also, there was questions around the a diagnostic pathway in regards to facts. Now, what I would like to say is that I have been having ongoing conversations with Dr. Pat Tui in regards to getting a diagnostic pathway formed because there are only a handful of pediatricians in New Zealand who are actually able to diagnose facts at the moment and some of them are only through the public system. So unless you live in that area, sorry, you're not going to get a diagnosis. And hence why I have been having a lot of conversations with Pat Tui around this. And the last conversation with him was actually on the 6th of March, and that's around, we. I know that over in the UK, they are currently diagnosed uh, developing a clinical pathway for fetal valproate syndrome and our discussions with Pat Tui was around you know once that has been published please can we have it being trialed in New Zealand in a DHB catchment area. Now he was very supportive around this and of course there was no money offered from the ministry in regards to this but we have possibly found, FactsNZ have possibly found a DHB that is willing to run a trial of this clinical diagnostic pathway for fetal valproate syndrome once it becomes available. So there is more going on that than perhaps MedSafe are aware of regarding this aspect and it's an ongoing issue that we have been battling. Hence why we actually had put it into the uh, petition because we need to be changing this. Well I hope that there is an inquiry that is forthcoming. At the very minimum there needs to be a lot of changes. But also I'd like to just reiterate that we are not statistics or numbers. We are people. And, you know, the reason why I put it in is because I'm supporting those people who have had babies harmed by these medications. We cannot undo what has already occurred to them. However, moving forward, we can form a positive partnership so they don't, the next generations who are taking these medicines don't have to go through what we've been through. And they can get informed consent, which is part of the health and disability consumer rights. To all of my FACS family, I just want to say kia kaha.